Good morning. Welcome and thank you all for joining this uh, UCAMS Global Women's Breakfast. As you are probably aware, the Global Women's Breakfast is an initiative from IUPA. And the idea is to have uh, women chatting around a cup of coffee, discussing on issues that deal with empowering women in, in science. It is usually celebrated close to the International Day of Women and Girls in, in Science, which took place recently. It is a worldwide event. And uh, last year, for example, there were 350 of these breakfasts in over 70 countries. Uh, UCAMS had its own breakfast, but I will come to that uh, later. For uh, this session, for today's uh, breakfast, we have chosen uh, a particular topic, which uh, has to do with the situation of women in senior positions in academia and everything that is related to the so-called leaky pipeline. We are very happy and very thankful to count with an excellent panel of experts, three researchers from uh, different disciplines and different countries, Professor Ludgarde Buidens from the Netherlands, Professor Leslie Yellowlis from the UK, and Dr. Giovanna Malik from Switzerland. The idea is to have this a very interactive event. So uh, we are going to have uh, polls for you. We are going to take questions and answers. We have already received in advance some questions and answers from the participants. And also there will be questions to and from the panelists. Empowering women in chemistry is not only a problem of the female community, we are very aware that we have to count with our male colleagues on board. So therefore, we are very happy and, and very thankful to Professor Floris Rutges, who's the current president of UCAMS, who's joining us today, and who will now give you a short uh, welcome address. Floris, uh, the, the floor or the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pilar. Also from my side, uh, a very warm welcome to, uh, to everyone here. I think it's really good that um, UCAMS started organizing its own version of the Global Women's Breakfast. And um, I'm very grateful um, to uh, Pilar Goya, uh, the, the former president of UCAMS, who is playing a very important role in organizing this, of course, very much helped by Nineta and the staff in the uh, UCAMS office. Um, although the name, um, suggests that this is an event only for women. Uh, perhaps it is also important that it is attended by some men. And I'm, I'm glad to see that I'm not the only man here uh, who is attending. Uh, it, it would definitely not be good if only women or only the women in UCAMS would be emphasizing that women must be better represented uh, in various aspects of the chemical field. And therefore, I'm glad to be here and speak a few words in my role as president of the European Chemical Society. As you most likely know, the European Chemical Society is an overarching chemical society, which has over 40 national member societies as its members. And in this way, UCAMS is representing approximately 120,000 chemists, women and men um, all over Europe. Uh, UCAMS plays a role in shaping policy at the Euro European level, uh, we advise, for example, on policy aspects to European politicians. Um, uh, as for example, we are part of the high level round table on the implementation of the chemo chemical strategy for sustainability, a round table that directly advises to the European Commission. We organize conferences like the UCAMS Com Chemistry Congress that will be held in Lisbon later this year, um, but also um, all kinds of webinars, as for example, um, a webinar series that started last year on the UCAMS periodic table, uh, which is about the scarcity of elements. 
And um, in fact, you may actually mark already April 26 in your agenda when the next webinar will be held. This is one that is about the element nitrogen and its importance to society, but in particular also about the challenges it gives to our society and how they should be addressed. And there are many more. But importantly, in all these activities, UCAMS is very keen on having inclusive teams of people since uh, diversity and in particular also gender balance are very important to us. In other words, UCAMS fully supports the goals of the Global Women's Breakfast Initiative, uh, which is to strengthen the position of women in all aspects of chemistry. Well, and therefore I'm eager to learn what will come out of the discussions today and also to see how we as UCAMS can further contribute to realizing what needs to be done and to further empower women in chemistry. And with that, I would like to give the word back to you, uh, Pilar. Thank you very much, Jan. Not just for your presence here today, but also for the continued support that you provide to the UCAMS task group on inclusion and diversity, which is the one responsible of uh, organizing this, this breakfast and all, for all the other issues dealing with this uh, topic. As I said in my introduction, uh, last year we already had the first edition of our breakfast. And uh, we have just uh, prepared a, a short video so that you get a feeling of uh, how the event ran last year. So Laura, perhaps now we can watch the video. We have always strived for a uh, balance and diversity. Despite Marie Curie and her two Nobel Prizes and many, many successful females since her, the structural inequity is still there. When we think about STEM subjects, we know that girls perform as well as or often better than boys in science and maths at school. And yet far fewer girls go on to, to follow STEM-based uh, study beyond school at university and at college. Because this is a general problem, it's not a women problem. My credo, which is in line with my personal belief and also guides my actions and decisions in my life, is fairness and transparency. Uh, chemistry is really a journey of creativity and discovery that brings so many positive real-life impacts. It's never been more important that we're able to attract the very best talent into STEM, the STEM community. And that's irrespective of gender, of course. Breaking stereotypes in the youth will empower the youngest generations of today to become confident leaders of tomorrow. I learned the importance of mentoring. Mentoring taught me to understand that we all have good things to share. There are other people in different career stages Stages that we can definitely help. Always very good to put yourself in other person's shoes and look this case out of the box and get another perspective. It, this is really important that you are not alone. So discrimination is internal and you think you're alone. To fight discrimination, you have to externalize the problem and not fight alone. We are part of this global endeavor and we really must be very proud. We are part of a huge network. There are women meeting on the same topic, starting from New Zealand and ending up in Hawaii. So we are a real global network. And I think, as I say, it's going to be a most interesting sector. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, now, uh, we are going to start with, uh, the, with, the, with our panel. And uh, before, let me just mention that uh, UCAMS is very active in, in all these subjects that have to do with gender and inclusion issues. So I will just choose two uh, events that we have done in, in the past, just to give you an idea of the sort of things we do. Uh, now, uh, Laura, if you can uh, share the screen. Now, as I was saying, we have done other, other events uh, on, on, along these lines. And on, uh, on 2019, we had an important workshop 
in the European Parliament. And there we were very glad that we counted with one of our panelists today, Ludgarda Guidens, and she talked there uh, on the subject of toward equality in science. But also last year, we were very lucky and we counted on uh, Ale Palermo. She's responsible for inclusion and diversity in the Royal Society of Chemistry. And we held a very interesting webinar uh, towards a more inclusive chemistry community. With all these uh, figures and, and on, on, on all this, Professor Ludgar de Guidens uh, has prepared her talk. I am not going to introduce the speakers because you have a full or a detailed CV of them in the program, but let me just say that Ludgar de Guidens is a professor of analytical chemistry. She's also the Dean of the Science Faculty of Radboud University and her field of experts, expertise is mainly chemometrics. Uh, so, uh, Ludgarda, please. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Pilar. And I'm really honored to speak here again for this uh, Global Women's uh, uh, Breakfast. And I'm really glad there are so many participants and really want to join our thoughts and things we should uh, do. And we, and as chemists and as scientists, of course, we first want to know the figures. And that's what I will do now. I will give you a short overview of uh, the figures. What are we talking about? And as Pilar already said in 2019, I already this in the Europe presented this in the European Parliament. These uh, these figures and here is one example of uh, of that one from the United Kingdom. And several countries have that. We don't think we have that for Europe in its whole or from UCAMS on its whole. It might be a suggestion that that UCAMS also gathers these numbers and also monitors uh, these numbers. But you see, I think everyone knows this graph. It's um, known as the leaky pipeline. Uh, the blue line here, the upper line, it re represents the percentage of uh, males in uh, uh, several positions going from junior, from students up to full professors. And as you see, the percentage of males increases steadily. And uh, it sometimes calls the leaky pipeline, as you say. But however, the longer I think about that and the longer I have experience with that, it's really a wrong name. We shouldn't call it the leaky pipeline because that suggests that women are leaking out of this um, whole process. And that's, yeah, that happens of course for partly, but it's really only part of the problem. So we really should find another name. It's rather a semi-permeable pipeline. But that's, so you see here indeed in 2018, this was the situation in the United Kingdom for chemical sciences. If I go to the next slide, Laura, can you show me the next slide? Yeah, thank you. That is the um, landscape in academia in the Netherlands. So this is not only sci uh, chemists, uh, uh, chemical sciences, but all acad uh, academics. You see, it's about the same situation. You go up to 80 to 90% males at the senior level, while at the lower, the lower, more junior levels, such as student, graduate student, PhDs, and so on, there about you have about a 50-50 percentage. So that was the situation in 2018. But then I would like to show what's the situation now. Did we improve? And for that, I share with you the the figures of the the Dutch network of female academics. And they made a comparison between the situation that it was at 2000. Well, 2000s for many of you, that may seem as almost last century. But for me, actually, and maybe also for some of it, it, it really feels as yesterday. But 
you see there the situation in 2000, which is represented by the red line, where you where you had more than 90 percent, 90 10 percent uh, share of uh, male female in academics at the full professor level was a bit more serious or quite more serious than in the in 2020, where you see that the brown or the orange um, line. There, what can you see there? Well, I would like to give you a few remarks on uh, or with this figure. This is again academics in general, so not chemistry. So keep in mind, chemistry or sciences in general lag behind. Second remark is the Netherlands, that may be good news or bad news, depending on the viewpoint you say, is really in the worst quarter of all European unions as far as it concerns female equality or gender uh, share of uh, academics. So the chance that in your country it is even better or that the, it's not that worse is real. So what you can see indeed here is that there is an improvement over those 20 years. And it, the improvement is over all levels. It's as well in the junior positions as in the senior positions. You can even see that now in the PhD candidates and in the assistant professor level, it's pretty close to equality. It's almost, it's more than 40% uh, female scientists that are, that are in there. Keep in mind, this is uh, academics in general. So what especially, however, in the, in, uh, the more senior uh, career uh, positions, such as associate and full professor, there the problem is actually still serious. You see for the numbers, 25% full professors at 2020 in, um, in the Netherlands then, that was for academics in general, 18% was for uh, the sciences, and that compared to 3% in uh, 2000. So still, while it has been improving, it's still not okay. So, and especially at uh, more senior levels, there is still a problem. And what else that you can see here in this figure is that if we continue at this pace, we will reach the uh, equality uh, line at 2040. And that's then a question, do we want to wait to 2040? Is one question if, and then at the same pace I said, and then the question is where does the improvement come from? If you analyze the figures and you cannot see this in this uh, graph, but the major steps forward that have been made, at least in the Netherlands, was when there was a dedicated action from the Research Council or the government to, uh, to dedicate, to, um, uh, yeah, to increase uh, the number of uh, female professors at the, at the several levels. And that had an, uh, that had an, an, uh, an impact. So that remains the question, indeed, what will happen if we don't have any more those impulses from the Research Council of the, will it ever normalize? It's kind of a uh, major question. Then one more thing, what, what I see actually in the, as a Dean of the faculty, I have been the Dean of the faculty for the last years and especially, at a higher level, there you see the, the bias problem. So you see uh, the implicit bias, which is the underlying mechanism often to, uh, for that inequality is higher at uh, more senior levels than at the more junior levels. And that is, of course, because those senior levels are kind of quite important 
positions for the faculty, for the university, for the department, for whatever. So make to, for the appointment uh, commissions, it's quite important that they make a, a, a good and the best selection of the best person to be nominated. And there the danger of implicit bias is bigger then at more junior levels at the moment where you see that there are positions, they are crucial, but not as crucial as the senior professor nominations. So that is certainly one aspect that is uh, still playing and where we should uh, work on. And then there is one other thing that maybe we should keep in mind and maybe worry a bit because these are simply the percentages of, um, of share of female academics. It doesn't say anything of the level within a certain position. For instance, at least in the Netherlands, you have full professors, you have two levels in there, uh, level one and level two. And as you can imagine, one level has a higher salary, then the other level is a higher rank. If you compare those numbers, those are still very bad numbers. Okay, but that is something that is not reflected in this kind of figures, but is really an existing, um, an existing threat too, something that we should keep in our mind. But as a summary, I could say that yes, we are improving. Yes, we are on the uh, we we are on the good way. We 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 uh, we really come more towards equality. But yes, there is also still much work to do. So I think if uh, I took my time and I will give the screen back to uh, to Pillar. Thank you very much, uh, Lutgarde. I think it's been an, an excellent introduction because really in order to highlight the problem, we need figures and, and data. And you have done a very good panorama of where we stand and what can we expect. And uh, by the way, concerning your suggestion, it's a, it's a very good one. And UCAMS is already working on that. We have uh, already asked our member societies uh, that Floris mentioned that there are over 40, that we really need to have their data in order to have this, this, this data for ourselves and for chemists in Europe. So thank you very much. Now, as I, as I said in the introduction, we have a poll for you and uh, Ludgarde has prepared a, a question uh, which has to do with, with the bias and uh, now Laura will, will share the screen and you will see the procedure, how you have to answer this poll. But in the meantime, I will just read you the, the, the suggestion of, of, of Ricardo. The question is, uh, will the bias automatically disappear when there are more women academics? It can be yes or no, yes. Once the percentage of female seniors is bigger than 40%, it will remain stable and no directed actions or support will still be needed. How we are going on with the uh, gender bias. Maybe, uh, Lutgarde, you would like to comment something already? Okay. Ah, oh, no, great. Uh, here we have... Uh, oh, I see them. Yeah, okay. okay. Then I think it's... For I, you. Didn't see, I didn't see, see the results, but that's... What, um, yeah, I really, I think I agree that directed actions will, uh, will be... Still, I hope that we should have... That we should... Instead, we should try to replace those... Uh, wait a minute. I will. I will put on my. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I. I. I tend to agree that direct action will be necessary for a long time. Still, I would like to to aim that it's not necessary anymore, and that we find a way to do to even if there are not support or there is there are no quota or there is there is nothing that it's 
that the bias fully disappears, that we find a mechanism for that. And that, and, but I agree that that's not for tomorrow and not for next year. So I tend to agree with, with this. Thank you very much, Lutgarde. And I, uh, I know you always uh, are an expert on, on gender bias and there are some questions from the audience and also from the panelists. So I think we will have a chance to discuss on, on, on all kinds of biases uh, and on a later stage. Thank you very much. Okay, now I think we are going to move to our next uh, panelist. Uh, she's... Uh, Dr. Giovanna Malik. She is assistant professor and uh, group leader at the Adolf Merkel Institute at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. And her field of expertise is uh, nanomaterials. She's been very active in EYCN, so she's uh, a well, good friend of uh, UCAMS already. So uh, Giovanna. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to contribute to this important discussion. Well, the issue of the lack of uh, women leaders or leadership in the leadership positions in STEM is uh, widespread. And um, this stimulates a number of ongoing discussions, including this one. This is also a very complex issue. And with that in mind, I would like to briefly touch upon a specific category of women aspiring for senior positions in STEM, which are those on their path to senior professorship positions in academia. Now, as we've nicely seen with the statistics uh, outlined at the onset of this panel discussion, which is also reflected in the facts and figures that we all experience across our institutions in Europe as well as globally, while there are women at all the levels in academia, this number progressively gets lower as we approach senior professorship positions. And this leaky pipeline stimulates a number of programs to address the issue, such as the one that I have personally experienced as the fellow of the Swiss National Science Foundation Prima funding scheme, which supports exceptional female researchers with the potential of obtaining a professorship in Switzerland that I would like to refer to as an example today. Now, this program has been introduced just a few years ago. And although at its infancy, it has already contributed to increasing the number of female professors in Switzerland, which has been achieved by using a program that I find particularly important to outline on, on this occasion. Now, this has been achieved by not only focusing on providing resources in the form of financial means to support independent research of a female researchers aspiring to professorship, but also complementing this with additional measures and contributions that are very relevant. Now, in particular, it supports unconventional career paths in the sense that, for instance, considers reduced mobility, uh, referring to the conventional mobility of changing institutions or crossing borders nationally or internationally, which can be motivated by different reasons, including professional or personal ones, such as family considerations, for instance. Now, instead, the program recognizes a multitude of different levels of mobility, including, for instance, international exchanges and collaborations, as well as uh, intersectional or intellectual mobility in the sense of interdisciplinarity or exchanges with the other organizations or general public, which are, also, which are also very important for aspiring academics. Now, apart from this level of support, the program also provides a more direct support to academic mothers, which is also something that I have had the chance to recently experience having given birth to my daughter just five months ago. Now, this has not interfered with my research continuity, as I have been granted childcare allowance, as well as the possibility to even hire a senior scientist delegate on site to support the students and coworkers during my maternity leave, which has ensured uh, research continuity as well as productivity during that time. Now, in addition to these levels of uh, support in terms of research funding, uh, recognizing unconventional career paths, and providing family support, 
This program stands out as it also offers a unique mentorship and leadership program that are sponsored by the funding scheme. Now, specifically, this involves, apart from general lectures, workshops, or interactive sessions, the opportunity to network with some of the leaders in Switzerland, as well as uh, uh, globally, as well as benefit from individual mentorship and coaching involving professional academic coaches and mentors of our choice that provide individualized insights into the academic job market and guidance with respect to our career plans. Now, all in all, this removes certain obstacles and empowers women on their path to obtaining professorship. Now, all in all, this is only a small example of what our funding agencies, national policies, or institutional programs can do to support women aspiring to senior uh, positions in STEM by providing resources, removing some of the systemic barriers for their professional development, and offering mentorship and leadership opportunities to realize their career plans. Now, this, is, uh, this specific program is, of course, not sufficient to resolve the issue, but I believe that it can make a difference. And other similar uh, initiatives that recognize these factors can make a, an important contribution in fixing the leaky pipeline, which is something that I look forward to discussing in the course of this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna. Uh, while we are preparing uh, the next poll, uh, let me again uh, say thank you to you for giving us the point of view of an earlier stage uh, career researcher and, and also uh, talking about your personal uh, situation with being a, a recent mother. Now, the uh, poll that uh, Giovanna has prepared is here on the screen. What are the main factors contributing to the leaky pipeline for women in senior positions? Systematic discrimination, lack of resources and support, lack of mentorship leadership programs, all of the above or none of the above. I, I liked uh, Ludgarda's comment that perhaps we should not use the term leaky pipeline Although mm, I have to say this, this is such an extended uh, you know, terminology, but maybe uh, Ludgarda has a point when, when it's not really probably the, the, the best way to mention this, this phenomenon, no? So perhaps we should think of other uh, alternatives, but the fact is that it is uh, very, extended and, 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 and everybody knows what we are talking about when we use these, these, uh, these words, no? But okay, I think they, they, are, they are right. And uh, the, the other thing that uh, sometimes uh, with these um, specific programs for women or specific initiatives, sometimes, and we will perhaps have time to, to discuss that, sometimes, it's, it's the women or the, or the female colleagues that don't like to apply to these uh, programs or to these initiatives because they really want to be on the same, exactly the same terms as the male, as the male colleagues. But on the other hand, it is well known that unless we do some kind of, 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 of discrimination, of positive discrimination, we will never arrive to, to, the, to our goal and, and to smash, as Leslie says, the, the, the glass ceiling. So, okay, this poll may, be, may take a bit longer or no, okay, great, it's already there. And now perhaps um, Giovanna, you can have a look and perhaps uh, give us your, your comments on the results. Sure, with pleasure. I think this is also a very difficult uh, question to outline very specifically because there are indeed many factors. And I also ag agree with you, Pilar, and with, uh, with Ludgarde, the, when it comes to terminology, it does make a difference. Because when speaking of the leaky pipeline, we, uh, we, uh, we associate this with a certain spontaneous process that is really not the case. And we see a lot of these systemic pushbacks that are uh, not really associated with with this process. I see here that the uh, that the audience mostly recognize it that all of these factors are important. I do agree with that, 
And what I also see here is in the results that apart from the systemic discrimination, the audience recognizes nearly equal importance of both the resources and support, as well as mentorship and leadership programs, which is something that I really strongly agree with. And this is what I try to uh, highlight in, in my brief, uh, brief opening to stimulate this discussion. So I, I really believe that uh, investing in uh, such uh, instruments uh, when it comes to promoting women and uh, empowering women to, to, to take on some of these leadership positions in STEM are essential. So I look forward to also continue to continuing this discussion based on the results of the poll later on. Yeah. I, I, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanna, for improvising uh, a reply with all this uh, data. And uh, I think, yes, this provides us the feeling of the, of the audience. So it's a, it's a very good uh, input that we have. Now we are going to move to our next uh, panelist, uh, Leslie Yellowlis. She's professor of inorganic electrochemistry in the University of Edinburgh. In, in Scotland, and she was the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, the first woman president in 175 years of history. So, <laughs> Leslie, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And you, uh, it was a great honor and a privilege to be the first president. And you know what's even delighted me more is the fact that we've had, uh, we're on to our third one now. So, our fourth one, just about. So, if it's really exciting because uh, it's awful to reach a high and then have nobody else follow on behind you. So thank you and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's uh, a wonderful opportunity and I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, in a, a little while. So I'm going to speak today about what is responsible for the leaky pipeline and what can we do about it. And I'm going to refer a lot um, on a book that uh, a report, I was going to show it to you, but I can't, uh, a report from the Royal Society of Chemistry entitled Breaking the Barriers. And I would encourage you all to go away and read it. There's some good numbers in there about the chemical sciences and what can be done in helping solve this um, leaky pipeline or the semi-permeable membrane as Garda called it um, and uh, let's not get too fixated we all know it's the leaky pipeline so I'll refer to it uh, of that today. So what is responsible for that leaky pipeline and I was interested to see from Luke Garda's figures in the Netherlands for all academics that the biggest decline was from um, was before you got to the senior positions. Uh, and I would say that there are three main reasons for the, the leaky pipeline that I've experienced, um, both through the Royal Society of Chemistry and through being head of science and engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Um, people leave. There's a lack of promotion to sen more senior positions, not the top, but just on the pipeline, on the career trajectory. And some people just don't want promotion. So I would just like to look at uh, each of those in turn briefly. So what are the reasons given for our younger people, our younger academics for leaving academia? Why did they go? And there are several reasons, but the ones that are most often highlighted are the long working hours. And I should perhaps preface that by saying it's the perceived long working hours. I don't think there has to be long working hours, but people perceive there have to be long working hours if you're going to succeed in academia. Many feel there's a lack of support. There's unquestionably the unconscious or systemic bias that uh, uh, Lutgaard has already spoken about. There's the macho culture that is often um, experienced. There's a lack of family considerate conditions and it was wonderful to hear of uh, Giovanna's experience, but that needs to be expanded. That we need to get these special programs out there to help with these family considerate conditions. There are inflexible structures and we know there's a lot of inflexibility in the system. But there's also this feeling of isolation. Many people feel completely isolated uh, and that's not a nice way to feel. That's not how we should be encouraging young people to stay in STEM. Promotion. 
Of course, promotion is key to solving the leaky pipeline. So how can promotion processes be improved? Well, in my opinion, the criteria and the process must be very transparent. It must be fair, but it must be transparent. Individual circumstances must be fully recognized. In other words, all contributions must be valued and parity between research, teaching and leadership must be understood at all levels. Universities can shift criteria. They can shift the criteria for promotion as long as they make that transparent. And in doing so, they must change the paperwork accordingly. As well as a lack of women in promotion, we also see a lack of women being put forward for prizes, for awards. I noticed that very much at the Royal Society of Chemistry. And we did a lot of work to promote prizes and awards and make sure women were being put forward for those prizes and awards. Because we all know that in a CV, a prize and an award counts for a lot when you come to promotion. And we have to work with referees because if we're changing the promotions criteria, then we have to explain to referees that that's what we're doing and the referees must reflect that as well. Referees carry an important part in pr the promotion process and they must be looked at. Some do not want promotion and the reasons given for that include the imp imposter syndrome, which is alive and well, and I'm sure all of us that are here present today have experienced imposter syndrome and lived it. Many are content with their current role. Many find the work-life balance important. There's a lack of positive role models. And finally, one quick, uh, issue that we've not addressed is stress and mental health and mental well-being is very important and some don't want to take on the additional stress of promotion. So what can we do to increase and lead to a more diverse leadership? Well, I think we need to increase the number of role models, the number of mentors. We need to increase people who will not only sponsor and champion people. We need to expand uh, networks. We need to highlight the importance of support and leadership programs. Middle management for me is key. Senior management often get why they, uh, you've got to have a diverse leadership, but middle management are often a block and we need to look at that key part of the career pipeline. We need to encourage flexible working. And finally, it is all about culture and how can we change that culture? It's not a quick fix, and it's certainly not going to be quick if it's to be sustainable, and we want it to be sustainable. And it requires men and women to buy in and affect that change. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leslie, for your interesting uh, talk, and also for the many suggestions for a way to move forward. Now, while we are preparing the, the poll, which deals with uh, work-life balance, how important it is work-life balance to you, which is, I think, a, a, a question of the utmost importance. So you have all kinds of uh, intervals there that you can, you can answer. And uh, OK, while, while you do that, now, uh, OK, uh, how are we doing? And you know, uh, Leslie, we would appreciate if you comment uh, these uh, results. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I, I really wanted to know this because um, I think work-life balance is becoming more and more important to people, um, not only to women. I think it's important to men as well. Um, and. I see that 67% of you think it is very important. I have to say, over my lifetime, uh, some parts of my career, I never thought about it at all. I'd just gone with the job. Um, but I think it, other times it became very important, particularly when I had my children. Uh, and of course, then it, uh, your mind is very much concentrated then. So thank you for that. Um, and I think it needs to be 
I think it needs, it's a topic that needs more discussion uh, and that we need to look and see how we can support people to achieve the work-life balance that is right for them. Because my work-life balance that's good for me is not necessarily what's good for somebody else. So I think we need to appreciate the differences of work-life balance and how we can achieve what's best for everyone. So thank you for that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, now uh, we are going to start the panel discussion as in, uh, in a real round table, you get uh, questions and answers from the, uh, from the panelists. So before we, we go to the questions from the audience, we have some for the panelists. We have uh, one for Luis Garde from Leslie, and it is uh, how do we ensure that gender issues are not overlooked with today's increasing focus on race. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a, yeah, that's a very good question, of course, with what everyone has in the back of its, his or her mind when I think it's certainly important to keep monitoring the numbers of females. On the other hand, the underlying mechanisms or many of the underlying mechanisms especially for the bias are the same for racial or no, um, social social discrimination or uh, or bias so i think when the awareness also for race and non-western is increasing on this yeah it will work hand in hand also that the awareness for females will increase will will increase so i so i think it will it goes hand in hand this uh, this thing and especially we don't have to forget we are here the european uh, chemical society but there are many female scientists also in africa non with a non western background they so yeah we actually as women we should also be aware that we yeah, we protect or we take these women to, uh, also in our um, in 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 our consideration. So I really think it's it's not it's it's not a contradiction. I don't think it's a threat, but we should of course keep monitoring fe the the female the the share of female scientists in chemistry and in science in general. But I really think if if uh, that it that it will help us to change the culture, the the attention to race. That's how I feel about that that one. I don't know whether you agree, uh, Leslie. Unmute. Um, yes, very much. I, I find it. I, that's why I posed the question. I wanted yeah. to hear your your answer. Is I think it's actually quite difficult. Um, and I think um, if we don't keep highlighting the gender issue, then I think, unfortunately, what tends to happen is people assume it's solved and therefore they don't pay attention to it anymore. And then we know that if it's not being sustainable, if it's not built into the culture, as I was saying in, at the end, then we find ourselves in 10 years back to where we started. Um, and that's certainly been proven in, in other institutions, not necessarily in, in academia, where they've done a lot of work, got women promoted, got women, you know, seen the buildup of that and, and it's worked very successfully. Then they've stopped highlighting it and they've gone back in 10 years and go, gone, how did we get back to where we start? You know, why hasn't that been sustained? And therefore, that's my question is, I think everything, I think, you know, I think it should be fair, it should be an equitable, it should be, we should be inclusive for everyone. But at the same time, I think it's important that we also keep highlighting and keep pushing the gender agenda, if you want. Yeah, I... I agree uh, with with uh, oh, yeah. yeah we we certainly should monitor it, but that yeah that fallback 
you know, whenever you don't pay attention for it, that's also kind of danger. We should find mechanism that that it stays stable also in a normal situation. It should, and that's that's what I'm struggling with. What are the mechanisms to make to make this disappear in the normal and in the, and that especially that implicit bias and all, all these things, how, how do we guarantee, are there tricks for that? That's, that's kind of the holy grail question for me. Thank you uh, both Leslie and Lutgarde. Now here's a question for Giovanna from Lutgarde. When women receive support by means of special programs, does that not put extra pressure on those women? Well, thank you very much for this question. This is a, a very important point to, to take into consideration. Indeed, I do have an impression that many of these programs do put a, an additional pressure on women receiving supports. And this comes in many different forms. For instance, there is often this uh, uh, prevailing attitude that people who do receive this support have received it by uh, simply being women without recognizing all the qualifications that come into consideration or even the systemic uh, barriers that they have been facing, preventing them to realize their full potential. In fact, the, the reality is often very different. And to give, to stay within the example that I have spoken about earlier, the SNF Prima program is actually one of the most competitive ones in Switzerland with some of the lowest success rates. That really tells us a, a different story. But now, more importantly, even though there are these challenges and, and unfairness that we are facing in the process, I really believe that it is our role to prove these views wrong by challenging them and pursuing this path. And in the process, really contributing to this critical mass and contributing to the presence of more role models that were outlined in both of these previous talks, which could make a difference not only for us and, and our generation, but also the other generations of, of women following on behind us so that hopefully one day these programs are no longer necessary, which I very much look forward to. I wonder what your opinion is uh, on this topic. Look at yeah, it. no, it, yeah, it's true, especially when there are only a few women in these things so then you are the only one in that special program and then you have to prove it so that that you really deserve it you yeah, yeah it is as if you have yeah you have to keep proving that you are yeah deserved that that uh, po uh, position on the other hand it is also true when there are more of these positions and we have that also in our faculty where we have it where we have at a certain time that we just we, we are going to hire the 10 best women the, in for the faculty in whatever the science field it is the only thing is they should fit for the research as at as and expertise within the faculty and we did that now a few times so there are quite some women in this program and that is also as you say quite competitive what you see there is that you see really top top of the level women so that you see wow no one can ever say there are no talented women if you saw these applications so that's the good thing about that and on the and then the second thing is also yeah the numbers eh? we have now quite some women appointed by that and you really proved to be good. So everyone now said, I want such a position in my department because they are such good people. So yeah, I think it's it's especially difficult when there are only a few and you are alone somewhere. So that's, and I, I would really advise faculties and things to, to, to then enhance these programs then so that so that 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 you come then indeed in the that the numbers that that that's the because there are so many or so many good ones that not every individual has to prove that again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you both. Now here's a question for Leslie, uh, Giovanna. Uh, 
uh, put it forward. Can we fix the leaky pipeline with initiatives such as the Athena Swan? Can you comment on this, Leslie, please? Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, uh, a good point. And, and because I knew you'd asked that, I didn't uh, speak about Athena Swan in my, in my five minutes. So that was kind of you to give me a second bite of the cherry. So thank you. Um, I. So I was involved in Athena Swan and, and that, I, as you know, started off in the UK, although it's spreading out more from the UK now. Um, and it was about how to advance women in, in, in academia and the importance and, and how did we, how could we do that? And it was to build a baseline, get your statistics, get your baseline, your groundwork, and then work to improve those numbers to see how you could improve uh, and improve the culture, etc. Uh, and it was all about improving the culture. And I was involved right from the word go and uh, Edinburgh, chemistry at Edinburgh were the first school, I think the first subject area in the UK to get a silver award. Um, and I was still, I, I mean, I led it, it was great. Uh, and I think it was incredibly important and but it was important uh, to everyone. So there was no point for me when we start out with Athena Swan at saying, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this for the women. It had to be that we were going to do it for everybody, but I knew that it was going to affect the women disproportionately better. And I think that's what was for me, the, the thing that pushed me on all the time. So I was always for it. And I think we saw a huge difference in the culture. We saw many more women applying to come to Edinburgh, which was uh, very rewarding because we put, nailed our colors to the mast. We said that's what we were doing and the university took it on board, et cetera, et cetera. I would say, however, I think in the intervening, what is it now, 17 years, um, when I started, it was, when I look now to when it was started, it's become much more bureaucratic. And I'm not sure that's what it was. Ever, I'm positively convinced that's not what was intended. But when I started, you know, we did it because we believed in it. Now there are people, that's their jobs to make sure that people apply for Athena Swan. So I think I know we've just done an Athena Swan review in the UK again and trying to take it back and make it less bureaucratic and I'm for that because actually what it did and what it stood for and what it helped people and departments and heads of department do and I think that was for me as a head of department was important that it gave us some sort of infrastructure it gave us some sort of way forward to push forward so uh, I would like to get back to that. I think that is what it's doing. Um, but do I believe it helped? I believe it helped enormously. Um, and do I think it still has a part to play? Yes, I absolutely do think it has a part to play. Well, thank you very much for, for answering this, this question. I've been always very curious and, and admiring the initiatives from the Athena Swan and, and, and wondering how much impact it does really have. And especially with respect to two points that you were highlighting also in your talk being the transparency yeah. and changing the culture. But we, have to, we can only change the culture by first recognizing or, or at the level uh, at which each of our institutions are at the moment of, of pursuing change. So it seems to me that uh, this uh, the system has a great potential to, to enable, to, to provide this to not only members of the certain institution, but also incoming uh, uh, students, faculty and, and others. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are going to take some questions from the, from, from the audience, but we are going to start with uh, those questions that were sent in advance. We gave the, the participants this possibility and they have already sent some questions. So the first one is addressed to Lutgarde and it has to do with implicit bias, gender bias and social class bias in the scientific career. What advice would you give to a young woman scientist facing gender and social bias in her professional career? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think everyone encounters this problem, I think somewhere in the career, I would say, stay calm, 
do not panic, I would say, because I think you have to keep in mind that it's not on purpose in the majority of the cases. It's not really, I think, the systematic discrimination of females is not something that people are aiming for. If you have an appointment committee, it is never, they never go into there and we will not appoint a woman. That, as far as I can see, it, it's never the intention. So it's, it's not on purpose. So that's, that's, you have to keep that in mind. So that there is that kind of implicit bias is a fact of life. So that's, uh, and what you can do, it's, it, it has already been mentioned as by Leslie, I think, and also by Jofana, go and speak. And it was also already in the, in the, in the movie of the previous one. So speak. The, the mentoring program is quite important. Speak to other ones, make it discussable. So if you feel that you are not promoted as you deserve, stay calm, but make, yeah, make, make discuss it, maybe with a mentor or maybe with your supervisor or whatever. Try to find objective things and try to, uh, to, to, yeah, to approach it in, a, in an objective way and talk to it and talk to it with many people. I think that's the, um, the best way to do it. And yeah, never, yeah, say, and don't be too shy to do that. You can simply say how you feel it as long as you say it in a, in a polite and, and, um, and, and um, yeah, yeah, adult way, I would say, it's in a grown up way that you say this, I don't, I feel this is not right. I feel I missed here a promotion. And can you explain me why? If you always ask explanations, you know, you make people think. And when you consider then that, yeah, that the vast majority is not willing to discriminate, the aim is not discriminating, you may, you may probably enter, uh, you may change these things and you can, yeah. But you should not, yeah, be silent and shut up and, and just cry. So that's something, but don't panic, just talk about it. And if it's not today, then it's tomorrow, but go for it. That's what I would, what I would say. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, a question which I think is, is important for the, the younger audience uh, to Giovanna, how many skills when not working full time due to having a child while in PhD. Well, this is a this is a very challenging question for many reasons, including the the fact that we all manage our time and uh, and feelings uh, differently. Although this feeling of guilt uh, already uh, feels very familiar. Now, if I uh, would like to provide a personal perspective, is that what I really find insightful and and important is to identify an environment which is supportive and which recognizes and values both of your roles, which are very important. It's quite incredible in, uh, on what academic mothers are capable of. And this is a, a valuable contribution to the, to the field. And in that sense, it is important to recognize the environments that value these roles. And those who do not, do not recognize really the importance of it, I believe that they do not deserve you. You are really uh, uh, capable of, of pursuing that. And uh, I hope that really this feeling of guilt does not stand in your way. And with that in mind, maybe I can also uh, connect to what Lugande was saying, being that uh, you are not alone. And it's important to, in that sense, if the environment at the moment is not as supporting and recognizing uh, of both of your roles, uh, Finding a community uh, is, is, is very important. And many of our institutions, if not all of them, do have communities of uh, academic uh, uh, mothers or women working in academia who recognize the issue and men who are allies who do very well recognize and respect the issue. So talking about it and finding the way to, to, to navigate this environment is an important uh, thing to consider. So I hope that this can really enable uh, uh, working mothers and academic mothers to realize their full potential and, and, and happiness and peace in the process. Thank you, Giovanna. And now uh, the last question from the audience, 
sent in advance to Leslie. How do we specifically help women of color or women from minority groups to get senior positions in STEM? Thanks, Pilar. A, a, a great question. I mean, intersectionality is a, a, a real, I hesitate to use the word problem because it shouldn't be a problem. You know, what we're looking for is to, to, to move it forward. But I think um, if I look back, back, I think we can take some of the lessons we learned on how we moved women as a whole forward and then look to see how we can implement that and help these intersectional um, uh, issues. So I think it's important that we get role models, that we have mentors, that, that people talk about it. And I, just as when um, we, we started on this to get women uh, put forward, we re I relied heavily on male mentors because there was no other mentorship around there for me. So I think it's important that we women who are not, or uh, that I'm not a woman of color, but that I understand what you're going through because I went through that just to get from a woman into a man's world, if you see what I mean. So I think it, it's up to us to help to support you. It's up to us to talk about it and to make sure that, that, that what you're, you're saying is recognized and that we can take those points forward and that we can help you gain the promotion, gain your career, because why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we do that? And, and then once we've helped increase the number, then there are more role models in place, but we can't suddenly put role models in place. So what we've got to do is help get the role models there in place in the first, it, you know, initially. Uh, and that would be my way of doing it, is to see what I can personally do and what we all can personally do. And in order to do that, I come back to what uh, Garda was talking about. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it much more openly. Let's, uh, let's look for the solutions uh, together because we can find them because it's, an, it, it's imperative we do because that's, that's fair. Um, that's what inclusion is all about. That's what diversity is all about. Um, but we've got to talk about it much more and we've got to provide some more role models. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, there have been a couple of questions from the audience uh, that have to do whether uh, universities uh, should have different criteria for promotion for female faculty who have young families and significant childcare responsibilities. Are there universities that have special facilities like kindergarten schools? And also if it is reasonable to expect female professors to have comparable CVs to their male colleagues when they apply to promotion? This is a general question to all three of you. So whoever wants to take it, please go ahead. Leslie, thank you. Thank you, just, just very briefly. Um, uh, I, I certainly when I was um, head of science and engineering, I did look at our campus, which was a science and engineering campus at Edinburgh, and there was no nursery facilities. Um, and so we did get a nursery built. Um, uh, but, and that was through a lot of pressure from a lot of different people. So I think, it, you, you have to look for facilities like that um, uh, and make them available to everybody there. I would say that when I opened, when we opened that facility, the first question I got was, well, what are you going to do now for after school care, Leslie? So I think, you know, there's an expectation and we are right to meet that expectation and then it moves on. And so we should move on. So there are things we can do about that. I think there's room, and that's what I was really talking about, was when um, for promotion, I think it's incumbent on, on senior managers to understand that there is not only one route to promotion, that you can get promotion through many different things. Um, and it's not, before it used to be, how many papers had you published? How many prizes had you got? What, uh, how many talks had you given? How, many, how much grant income had you got? And these were all measurables and that was fine. 
uh, and that was <clears throat> in my day how you got promotion and to a certain extent I'm afraid to say is still prevalent today but what we can look at I think and what we should be doing is there's lots of contributions people make in academia and we should be looking at the full picture what is it that acad academia needs in its staff and it's not only research it's lots of different things but you have to get everybody to recognize that so don't try and be the same as the next person you know be yourself bring your own individual things in there but that has to be recognized and it has to be recognized at the top of the university yeah maybe i can yeah i certainly agree but that's also for not only for females, also for males, that every all those different aspects are quite important. We shouldn't be so that only the males are the paper producers and the females are the are the other things. So that's also that should be equally distributed. Also, what we did also in the faculty um, is uh, providing for women with on that are on pregnancy leave give extra money to to have some kind of extra postdoc or extra money to to not to um to to uh for their research to promote a little bit and not that it be that it's stagnated and that helps also so that during their pregnancy during their things they can someone or their research is going on so that's other uh, other possibilities that could uh, that that are helping and are appreciated by women also, but of course that cannot be done all over. So that's not. Yeah, I'm of course someone someone who is early in the in in, in the in the in the process of uh, in the senior academic uh, uh, path, and I really appreciate the the perspectives from both Lutkarda and Leslie. Something that I would like to add, however, that, that might not have been explicit and that relates to what Leslie was saying, uh, revising this the criteria by which uh, uh, people are assessed for certain positions. And I mentioned already that there are opportunities like some of the funding agencies are doing at the moment very actively, recognizing different forms of mobility, which are sometimes really uh, important for caregivers and are occasionally seen as a limitation, which is not necessarily the case because people are very mobile in many different other levels of mobility, of international exchanges, collaborations, uh, interdisciplinarity, etc. But also there has been a component that is increasingly uh, important in the assessments, which is to recognize these kind of they're often referred to as career breaks, which might not also be the, the best terminology, but taking these the time that is dedicated for caregiving, either for, for child care, family care, or caring for fa other uh, a family member, are really taken into consideration as, an, as a number. This can be quantified really as an amount of time the person is actually dedicated to, to, to this in this particular role and deducing this from the overall academic age. This SNF is now calculating academic age based on some of these requirements so really assessing the time that the person has actually dedicated and the achievement that has come out of it and balancing this in the assessment could be really uh, then uh, leveling the play field thank you uh, let me uh, bring forward another question from the audience uh, it says only a relatively small percentage of people either men or women achieve senior positions in either academia or industry. Therefore, to achieve parity in senior posts, do we need to aim for greater than 50% intake of women into STEM? Anyone? Uh... I, yeah, I think, yeah, what I understand from that question is, okay, there are only a minority, of course, of and men and women that, go through to the to the senior level but the equality is not that we aim that 50 percent of the women are are uh, senior the equality is that 50 percent of of this of all senior positions 50 percent is women and you can maybe say okay there are not enough women now to uh, to acquire that but yeah that is anyway that's given given that uh, the, the shape of that pipeline, that is something that we should strive to and aim to in, in, 
uh, 50%, whether it's 50% or 40% or anyway, it should be, yeah, it should be over 40%. And I agree, actually, yeah, it should, but that's of course not real. It's, it's this, if uh, it's also important that there are males in the, in the um, yeah, in the unreal situation that there would be 90% female full professors, then we should be worried about attracting males, but I don't think we are still there. So that's, but it, it's really the balance which is important. It's not, it, it's, and that's really an important uh, because yeah, everyone brings in different uh, males and females, bring in different expertise, different uh, attitudes. And it's the balance, it's the balance in life, in yeah, nature have a balance of ma males and females. So that should be in science too. So that's... Uh, So I, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, so if we look at a subject such as nursing, for example, then 90% then of the professors are indeed female. Um, and the, the, it's the flip. Um, and so it, we're looking here for um, a, an even playing field across the board. I, I, I think in terms of leadership, I mean, I've talked very much from being the leader as um, heading up a school or heading up a faculty or what, whatever. But of course, we've also got the senior leadership positions of the large grants, for example. And I know a lot of work has been done in Europe uh, about the lack of female PIs on big grants. Um, and I know Elsevier has done a lot of work on the lack of women PIs in grants and in publications and things. There's a lack of uh, senior women um, entrepreneurs, you know, starting up businesses and things, uh, things like that from their research. Uh, and so I think when we talk about uh, senior leadership um, and women, there's lots of different areas, you know, there's lots of different ways we can be talking about that senior leadership. And, and how is it we encourage women into all of these because it, the, the numbers are lacking in the mall. We, we tend to talk about the leaky pipeline and the um, title, if you want, that comes with that. But there's also, I think, the leaky pipeline in where are our senior women in these leadership PI positions, and we should be looking at that as well uh, and seeing how we can support women to do that. These are very important points, and I just want to add uh, one more important consideration, and this refers to the onset of this panel discussion when we have seen the statistics. So it's not only about reaching the 50%, but it's about really having the uh, equal uh, uh, representation when considering the uh, entry number of people who are in certain roles. We see that, of course, when it comes to leadership positions and, and male representation, there are only few leaders that do reach these positions. But if we look at the progression from the entry uh, point uh, into the process of the representation of male and female, this is where the leaky pipeline comes into place. And I just wanted to maybe re-emphasize this because I wasn't sure with respect to the question whether this was, uh, that, that this clearly came across. So it's not about reaching 50-50 uh, 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 by enforcing it if this was not the case before, but speaking for chemistry, we have across universities even more than 50% PhD students that are female, but we do not see this at the professorship level, it really gives us an impression that there's, there might be another issue that, that is being discussed here. Just maybe restating helps uh, uh, contribute to the discussion. Uh, well, I thank you. I think we can take uh, another one. Well, uh, this asks, uh, someone from the audience asked for comments on uh, it sounds like mending the leaky pipeline for women could improve conditions for all academic, regardless of sex. What's your opinion? I agree. I think uh, if we improve the conditions for everybody, um, and, and why wouldn't you? Uh, then it's been well proven that women um, benefit disproportionately. So if you want women get the better deal, but everybody, but everybody feels they're getting part of the deal. 
you know, so you've got to make the culture better. You've got to make working conditions better for everybody. Uh, and, you know, I think um, roles are, are switching. When we talk about childcare, for example, I think I, I observe in my younger colleagues that, um, you know, it, it's shifting from being um, predominantly female to very much more a shared responsibility. Uh, and therefore, we have to look at how, how everything can change to help everybody. Of course we should, that is what we should be doing. Yeah, I, th I think in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, but I think all over Europe, there is that the new wave of what do we value in science? Do we value only that H index or the number of papers or the citations? There are many, as Leslie already said, there are many, many other things that are important to, uh, to, yeah, to, to improve science and to make progress in, in science. And that's kind of, and that's quite important. I think that will also help women because it's not only the um, yeah the the, the the amount of money that you can uh, that you can uh, gather or the grants or whatever it's there are many many different aspects and that's not only for for women it's also for males because they also suffer under this kind of very tough uh, culture and that thing will also help and I think we should profit of that as females so that we we should because that yeah that it's a change of culture that is happening and that's good i entirely agree with both of the the statements i i, I really believe that uh, one of the the points that stimulates all these discussions is really that improving these conditions for for women improves the situation for all all the others and and this is what we are striving for in terms of uh, our, our colleagues attracting the best talent, having the, 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 the best working environment and, and family supported at all levels, which of course involves both male and female uh, representatives. Could I make one suggestion for you camps maybe? For uh, for <laughs> thing because one of the problems that we encountered, that I encountered also when I saw in the, the vacancy for senior positions in uh, in, you know, in, the, in my faculty and in the Netherlands in general, is that it's very hard, especially in chemistry, uh, to reach all female candidates. It's the, the number of applicants is quite low. So I think what, and in physics, they do a good job because there are many lists there of female scientists and the female scientists inscribe on that list so that, and you give your field of expertise and you say, okay, when, uh, when, when the board of, or the, when we are looking, when a board is looking for senior positions, at least you have a list where you can send it to and you can apply for. So at least you have reached those people. And in physics, they do a better job than in chemistry. So I think maybe that there is a role for UCAMS to make such a list where pe females can inscribe with their expertise, what, what is their next job expectations or something so that they can say, at least if we send them the vacancy, for a senior position or any position to that list, at least, yeah, you, you see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, I, this is a very interesting discussion and I am sure we could go on forever, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, I would like just to, to close with one final question to all of you. Someone sent it from the audience. And it's the distinctive qualities that women bring to and enrich the work environment in science. I would like to listen to the opinion of all, all of three of you. What difference that does it make when you have women in the environment? Who would like to start? Yeah, I can start if, if, yes. if you want so that... Uh... Yeah, I, I think it's quite it's the diversity eh, of attitudes, the diversity of approaching science and approaching problems, not only science, but approaching problems in the uh, and it's the balance that is important. And you cannot deny if you have a, a diversity in how you approach problems, you come to better solutions. And that's, I think one of the important 
things that women bring in. It's the, the it, it's a diversity of uh, ways how to tackle science also. It's it's another creativity. It's 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 a more yeah, you bring in more diversity. And that's not only true for women, it's also true for inclusion in general. Whenever you bring more perspectives into a problem solving process, you come to better problems, to, to, be, to better solutions, I mean. So that so you you approach the problem in, in better ways and it's it, it's kind of a de-escalating and that's as well when it's 100% women, it's a problem because then you go in a certain way of solving problems and it escalates. If you, if you have 100% males trying to solve the same problem, you, you escalate, but in another way. So that's, it's the balance that is important, the diversity. And I think the work balance, the importance of the work balance thing that is now so important is I think women have kind of a big part in that uh, discussion of the whole work-life balance. So I think, yeah, I think we can say that we make a little bit of a better world, scientific world for us. I, I cannot agree more really with, with, with what, what has just been said. And it's really not only about women. Our society is incredibly diverse and recognizing these diversities from the pragma pragmatic standpoint already known to be beneficial for uh, our working environments, for our science and for our research, problem solving by bringing different experiences and perspectives. But also the fact that we are such a diverse society and, and, and actively contributing to having this diversity reflected in our revi environments is only uh, humane. And it also contributes to a much healthier environment in that sense that more naturally reflects the, the, the state of our society. And this is, in my opinion, already a cause worth fighting for. So I, I, I absolutely agree. Of course, uh, we can't do the blank experiment. So I have asked um, several male colleagues, um, having gone into meetings and, um, and said, you, you know, how does it make any difference to you? You know, when it was a male, only male uh, committee or meeting or whatever it was, and now you've got women in here, has it, has it changed? And they say it changes the dynamics. Now I, I can only add, it changed the dynamics of the group, and and you know I think that's what diversity does bring. It changes the dynamic of a group, it, and uh, and I think that's what's important. And yes, we can get to a better solution, Lugara, but I think we can also get to that better solution quicker. So I think when we're looking to solve these grand challenges, we need to find the solutions. But for some of some of these grand challenges we're experiencing just now, we need to find those solutions very quickly indeed. Uh, and I think um, bringing it the diversity, and it's um, not only men and women, it's as you've said, uh, Giovanna, it's this whole diversity. It's how do we get uh, good representation from across the whole community to contribute as best we can. Um, but I, um, I must say, uh, as somebody who's worked in many different committees, I don't know about the rest of you, but the more diverse the committee, the more pleasure, but pleasurable it is to work in um, and the more I get out of it and then the more I get out of it I feel the more I can contribute to it so it's a circle and it just it's an empowering spiral upwards so uh, I'm all for diversity. Thank you that's a very good statement we are all for inclusion and, and diversity uh, I will just uh, say very few words for closing this, this session, obviously all of thanks. I will uh, have some, some slides that Nora will share now. Uh, well, uh, I would like to thank the uh, organizers and the coordinators of this event, Nineta, our Secretary General, Laura, Anna and Julieta. You can imagine that to put together this, this seminar, this webinar, sorry, with the, uh, all this uh, interaction with the audience and questions and so on. I think they have uh, dedicated a lot of effort and we should recognize them. Of course, I have to thank all of you for participating, all the participants. And also I am very grateful that you have been very interactive and I am sorry you have sent more questions that we could 
possibly answer, but I mean, if anyone is very interested, I am sure uh, you can address one of our panelists and they can provide or, or give you a, a, a suggestion or a, or a quick answer. Uh, I would like, of course, to thank especially our, our panelists and our president, president of UCAMS, for being here. Uh, you have done an excellent job. You have been always from the beginning very supportive to this uh, global women's breakfast. So I really appreciate Lucarde, Giovanna and Leslie, your time and your dedication to this. Um, I would like to tell you that, uh, okay, uh, next year we will uh, uh, prepare another breakfast under a different topic, let's hope. But in the meantime, those of you who are interested, I am sure, or we still will be preparing something on inclusion and diversity for our next uh, UCAMS Chemistry Congress, of which uh, Floris has already spoken about. This will take place in Lisbon. Uh, this is the, the, the great Congress of UCAMS, and there we will devote some time to discussing inclusion and diversity. So I would like to invite you all to, to participate or, or well, not only on inclusion and diversity, but also on any topic of chemistry that you would like. And uh, finally, uh, let me say to you that if you would like to have a certificate for your attendance to this meeting, we are very willing to provide. And so the only thing is that you would have to request it to events you can see you you have the address there and of course you will you will get it so thank you very much indeed and okay good morning to all you thank you bye thank you